So after that amazing introduction by, and keynote by Dimitri, um, we're now down to the hard stuff. And uh, James is going to talk about uh, fine tuning for vector search. Uh, James is a staff developer advocate at Pinecone and a freelance ML engineer. And you focus on NLP and vector search uh, from the perspective of education and real world implementation. And he's worked in the past with Deloitte and UBS. Um, James, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so today we're going to talk about fine tuning embedding models. Um, but before we jump into that, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself and, and say hello. Uh, okay, so I'm James. I'm the uh, one, nine, one minute. I'm the staff developer advocate at Pinecone. Um, I'm also an educator on a few platforms, so YouTube, uh, Medium, Udemy. Um, I'm run a kind of like a NLP consulting firm, and we do a few NLP projects over there. Um, and I also do freelance ML engineering and, and some advisory work as well. Now, uh, when we talk about fine tuning embedding models, there's uh, like a huge amount to cover. So we, we're kind of going to go through everything pretty quickly. It's going to be kind of like an overview of all the different methods or a few of the different methods, not all of them. Um, so what I've done is, you know, I, I generally like to back everything with some, uh, with some code. So what I've included in the slides here is like a link to a lot of the code that will cover what we're talking about. Uh, and there's also an ebook that um, I wrote. So this ebook kind of is everything we're going to talk about here, uh, but in a lot more detail. So you can have a look at that if you're interested. So similar to Dimitri's uh, pyramid of vector search, I have a temple of semantic search. Um, so the semantic search for me, I think of it as being kind of held up by two different disciplines, which is NLP and vector search. Now, within those two disciplines, you have two like main components that kind of go together. Um, within vector search, you have a vector database, and within NLP, you have these embedding models. Okay. Now, on the vector database side, uh, you, you're basically looking for a database which is going to uh, allow you to retrieve similar vectors um, as, as quickly as possible and, and do that with like quite accurately. Um, and a few nice houses, such as things like metadata um, filtering and, and like good data management. And that, hello, it's very loud. Um, that's going to look like this. So we're going to have a load of vectors, uh, kind of like Dimitri already explained. Um, all of these represent some piece of information, whether that's text, images, or, or something else. And uh, given a particular query, like this one here, we basically want to return the, the most similar uh, context vectors or passage vectors uh, from that. And they will hopefully uh, be accurate, but their accuracy depends entirely on the embedding model. So uh, the embedding model, it, it can, look or it can do a few different things. So for example, uh, in this example here, we have question answering. Now question answering, we're taking questions, we have answers or context in this case, and we're trying to embed the ones that are relevant to each other as close as possible within that vector space. So that's why we have these two here, like you know, kind of pushed together. Um, and they can do other things as well. We have, you know, sort of vanilla semantic search, uh, so these, they don't share any of the same words, but they kind of have the same sort of meaning. Uh, so you kind of push those into the same vector space again. And you can do that with a load of things. Uh, like Dimitri mentioned, uh, you have multimodal uh, things. So you can put images and text into the same space. You can go across different languages and so on. So in the end, uh, all of that basically means the embedding model needs to create meaningful vectors. So there are, uh, like, I'm not sure what the numbers are, but there are at least thousands of these uh, pre-trained embedding models. Uh, you have a ton of them on Hugging Face, PyTorch, OpenAI, Cohere. Uh, you, you can find them, like, anywhere. Um, so, you know, why, why would we fine-tune anything when we have all of these, all of these models? Well, um, we can think of, you know, most of the most of the models that you find or the pre-trained models uh, they've been 
fine-tuned in this sort of area to the left of the graph um, where there's a huge number of data sets. So they have a very generic scope. Um, and okay, maybe you can start using like uh, OpenAI's GPT embeddings or Cohere's embeddings, and you can maybe pull yourself a little more towards the uh, right of this graph to the sort of the more unique domains. Um, but for the most part, you're probably going to get stuck uh, if you have a particularly niche uh, use case. And if you have that niche use case, you're probably going to need to start looking at uh, fine tuning your models um, on your particular data sets. So um, an another indication of why I think this is a, a good topic to talk about is that um, we get like tons of questions all the time uh, talking about just fine tuning these models. How do I fine tune these models um, from literally everywhere? You know, this is Discord, I get a ton of questions all the time about it. So it's clearly something that people are very interested in. Um, so I think we can all benefit from a, a little bit more uh, knowledge within the space of fine tuning. Um, so this looks pretty horrible, I know, but the the intention is that by the end of this talk, you're kind of going to look at this and just it's going to not look horrible anymore. Uh, so we're going to kind of cover all of this. Um, so generally, when we're fine tuning these models, uh, what we're really doing is just trying to compare items. Okay, so fine tuning these embodied model models um, is essentially just finding contrast between different items, whether that's text or images or whatever you have. Um, so we want to say like A is similar to B, um, but it's not similar to C, for example. Um, but obviously there are like a, a huge number of different data sets out there. Some of them are easier to find, some of them are a lot harder to find. So depending on your data set, you're going to want to use a different um, approach to fine tuning. So the, probably the, this would be the most ideal scenario, um, which is where you have, you have like your sentence um, A, sentence B or, or one, two, um, and you have some scores here, which are telling you, okay, how relevant um, are these two items? Like that would be great. Um, and if you can fine tune on something like this, you're going to get good performance, but it's really hard to find these sort of things. Um, so most of those, most of these sort of data sets, uh, they tend to be quite small. So what you can usually do is essentially use this as your final set. So on the, on the right here, we have that small, very specific data set. That's, uh, you know, what I just showed you and that includes your labels. Um, and, and what you, what you can do is before you get to that point, you can fine tune on a easier to find semantic similarity data set using a different fine tuning approach. So rather than like uh, cosine similarity loss, which is what you would probably use with the other data set, uh, you could use softmax lots, uh, multiple negative ran ranking or uh, something else. So those, um, those more generic items, those more generic ways of training, uh, they would come under the scope uh, for unlabeled text pairs, okay? So this sort of data set, it's still not super easy to find, but it is, it is easier to find. So uh, most data sets wouldn't contain any specific labels. Uh, in this case here, you can see, okay, we do actually have labels. So I'm, I'm lying to you, there are labels here, uh, but we're actually gonna filter those out and we're just going to use the labels that are entailment pairs, which means that they are actually related. So we're gonna do this. Okay, and then in this case, this is something that you can probably find a lot easier. Um, so these, you have these pairs um, and all of them are similar in, in some way. Um, and okay, so what we have here are the, we have, we call these anchor positive pairs or positive pairs. Okay, because they're all similar to each other. Um, but, you know, how do we, I said before, we need contrast, we need some pairs that are less similar and some pairs that are more similar to each other. So we, we don't really have that here. Um, so we need to find a way of, of getting that contrast. So uh, what you can actually do is, you know, we have those, those pairs and we can just kind of mix and match. So 
Um, we can take you know, anchor zero and positive zero, and we have all these other positives, and we can just add them to anchor zero. So you can have like anchor zero, positive one, anchor zero, positive two, and we just make some match. Uh, and then basically we know that, okay, we have the original pairs, and they, you know, they should be similar, right? They, they, they should be placed close together in that vector space. Uh, whereas these other ones here, they should not be similar because uh, they're random. So we are assuming, if we have a big enough data set, that they're not relevant. Um, so they should be kind of far apart. Um, okay, so there's this, just this kind of little visual. Um, so this is using something called multiple negative ranking. You can have your queries, your, your positives, and you kind of put those all together. But you see here, we're just sticking with a single query and we're going through all the positives. Uh, and that gives us all of our items here, which are not supposed to be similar. So they're kind of like a, a lighter, a lighter color on there. And then the diagonal here is like our actual similar pairs. Um, so this is just another example of that. Uh, so this is where we have our actual pairs. Uh, this is using multiple negatives ranking. Uh, we we'll convert those into tokens as we normally would with uh, transform models. Uh, and then we have this model here. So this is a, we call it Siamese model or a bioencoder or a sentence transformer. Uh, they all may mean basically the same thing. And uh, basically for every pair, this here is actually just one model. That's why I've got these like dotted lines. That's just a single model. Um, and you process both your anchor and your positive through that. And you get your, your vectors at the bottom here. Okay. In this case, th this, is a, this is a pair, right? So you want to push those two vectors together. Okay, so you're going to optimize this model here and push those two vectors together um, as closely as possible. Uh, in the other case, so these, this is where we mix and match and we've got something, some random um, positive. We're going to um, do the same thing, process everything the same, but instead of pushing these two vectors together, optimizing model for that, we're going to pull them apart. Okay, so this, uh, this, does work, uh, but, it, but it could be a lot better. And the reason for this is um, when you just randomly select pairs or randomly get pairs uh, from different places, um, they're probably not going to be that similar, right? And it's kind of like asking the model to spot the difference between two very obviously different things, right? So in reality, what we want to do is challenge the model a little bit more, like give it some harder pairs that needs to kind of differentiate between. Um, and we need to do that so that the, the model um, kind of learns more nuanced information um, and essentially challenges itself, okay? So by challenging itself, it's going to become a better model. Uh, so we want something kind of like more like this, where the, the difference, okay, it's kind of obvious in this picture, uh, but in reality, we're, we're going to pretend this is a good spot the difference image, and we're kind of like looking for those little differences. Uh, we want to do the same for our model, and we can't do that if we're just randomly selecting pairs. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we need something called hard negatives. So uh, hard negatives are items that are not positives, but our model is going to think are positives. Okay, so it comes back to that vector space again. Uh, we have, uh, these are the embeddings that the model is created. We have our query vector, and then we have these return context uh, vectors or passage vectors, call them whatever you like. Um, maybe in reality, only this one is relevant. Okay, maybe this one's the true pair, but then maybe the other ones, the other four items there um, are not, relevant pairs. So they're actually like that, then they should be negatives. Um, so they would be hard negatives. It's hard for our model to tell that they are not actually positives. Um, and basically we, we need to, we need to find all of these um, and teach our model or tell our model, like these should not be positives. You need to separate them more. So how, uh, how do we do that? We, we can do hard negative mining. So there's a, it's probably many different approaches to hard negative mining, but the two most obvious ones um, for me is just, okay, manual annotation. So we can manually annotate things. Uh, so we have our big data set. 
Uh, this is just the pairs, there's no labels in there. We index everything into a VEC database, um, you know, whatever you know, whatever service or, or, or tool you want to use there. Um, and then, you know, I, I would probably recommend like you make like a little graphical interface, um, but just would just make things easier or you just do it in the notebook, you know, whatever, it's up to you. And you can go through and you can manually add and say, you can go through some, like ask some questions or just take things from your data set and say, okay, um, this answer is correct. The other ones are not. Okay. And then you just feed all those into um, a, a big data set with your negatives. Um, and then obviously at that point, you, you feed it back into your model and fine tune it some more. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you can just automatically view that. Obviously, you know what the positives are in your data set. So if you don't think there's going to be that much overlap, you can just do that automatically in your code. Um, and yeah, that, that will work. So that's probably an easy way to do it. Um, so how many pairs do we actually need for this approach of, of uh, multiple negatives ranking? Um, so, that, so when people ask me this in past, I always, as a rule of thumb, I would always say like maybe around 10,000 pairs, but it really depends a lot on your data set, your use case, and like a ton of other things. So yeah, it, basically it depends. Uh, when I run these tests uh, the other day, I, by the 10K part, you're kind of getting into the into the zone of, of where the performance is going to end up. Um, 25K, you, you're, you're pretty much safe there. So if you, you have 25K or more, ideally, um, you can probably use something like multiple negatives ranking and you get pretty good performance, depending, again, on your data set, the quality of your data, and your actual use case. And oh yeah, also, so if you have negatives, the performance is going to increase a lot. Okay, so that's, these are without negatives. This is with those hard negatives. So if you can get those, you, you definitely should. Okay, so that pair data set is uh, much easier to, to get. Um, but what about if we, we don't really have any pairs or, or basically we have a very small data set. Um, so that would be called a low resource uh, scenario. So you, you, you find this pretty often, to be honest, depends on how niche your use case is. Um, so low resource just means you have very little data. Um, and there's a, there's a few ways of, of dealing with this. Uh, the first two that we're gonna look at is uh, pretty sort of directly dealing with this with um, a different approach to training. So if you have translation pairs, um, you can use something called multilingual knowledge distillation. Uh, and, and this is essentially, well, we'll, we'll go into it, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna train a source model uh, into our, our target language. So if you're doing multilingual stuff, this is really useful. Um, and if you literally just have text, you can also use something called uh, TSAE, which is an unsupervised approach. Um, to fine tuning these models. So let's first have a look at the first one of those, the translation pairs. Um, so we, we call this parallel data. Um, so these are text pairs in a source language and a target language. Um, the sort of pros for this is like, it's super easy to find that sort of data. You can, I think there's a, like a TED data set where they have the subtitles from each one that talks in tons of different languages. Um, and there are a lot of TED talks out there. So. That's one source. Uh, there are plenty of others. Um, but there are a few cons, of course, as there are to every training approach. Um, first, it requires an existing uh, use case model in the source language. So this is called the teacher model. Um, this is basically in your source language, let's say English is a pretty common one. Uh, you want a model that can perform the task that you want to do in the other language pretty well, but in English, for example. Um, and you also need a pre-trained model uh, that covers both the source and target languages. Okay, that's your student. Um, that one doesn't need to perform well on your use case. If it does, then great. Um, it, like your use case in the source language, if it does, it's, that's a, a bonus, but it doesn't need to at all. So with multilingual knowledge distillation, we're basically gonna take that teacher model which performs your task well, but only in your source language. And we're gonna use it to teach the student model through knowledge distillation, 
um, how to perform that task. And because that student model is multilingual, it will, uh, the, the way it's optimized is can be fine-tuned to cover both languages, even though we initially didn't have a model uh, that could perform in that target language. So this is what that looks like. It's actually you know, relatively, relatively simple. So we have like, this is our pair data at the, at the end on the left over there. Um, we have an English sentence and we have a Italian sentence. We feed both of those or we feed the English into the teacher model because it's not multilingual. It doesn't understand the Italian. Uh, and we get a English vector, okay? Or the, the English vector. Uh, the Italian one goes into the student model alongside the English, and that will create two vectors. We optimize between them to kind of push them into the same vector space again, so again, we're like kind of like contrasted thing, uh, and we use mean squared error to push those together, and then we just optimize the student model. So it's, it's kind of like it's, um, it's learning the weights from the teacher model and how best to represent them within its own, um, within its own model parameters and the multilingual vector space that it understands. Um, so another, another um, problem we might have is, okay, maybe we only have text. So we don't have any pairs at all. We literally just have a, a ton of unstructured text from a particular, uh, a particular target domain. So in this case, we can use something called TSAE. Uh, which is an unsupervised approach. Um, and this is uh, kind of similar if you, if you know BERT um, and you've worked with mass language modeling or, or pre-training BERT. Uh, what they do is they take a load of text and they just mask certain words in there or tokens um, and basically fine tune BERT in order to uh, get good at predicting those masked words. So, we're going to, with TSA, we, we do the same thing, but we do it at a sentence level, okay? So rather than, okay, we, we can still mask a particular word, or we can delete it, as we have here. But we then feed those sentences, like the, the original sentence and the kind of corrupted sentence, feed both those into an SBIRT or, or other um, bi-encoder model, and we say, okay, you need to put these as close together in vector space as you can, okay? And this is a, if, if you don't have any other option, this is a really good approach. Um, you, you will get at least some performance from this. Um, so obviously it's really easy to fine tune. You just need the, the text data, uh, the unstructured text data, um, but only, obviously there's a few problems. Uh, it only works for sort of vanilla similarity. So you're not gonna be doing question answering um, with, with this. And the performance just can't compare to other methods like supervised methods, uh, but that, you know that's, that's pretty typical. Uh, but if you if you don't have labeled data, it's a really good approach. Okay, so we covered um, low resource scenarios. Uh, what about if we have a very small amount of labeled data? Uh, maybe we can do something called data augmentation, so we can create more data. Um, so if, we're, if we have some data that is labeled already, you know, we found it wherever, or we're willing to annotate a small data set, like annotating 1,000 items is not the most fun thing in the world, but it is possible. Um, we can move on to something called uh, synthetic data augmentation. So essentially what we're going to need to do there is we're going to need to generate more pairs and then label them. Uh, so more pairs is pretty easy. We, we saw with uh, multiple negative ranking, we can just kind of mix and match, right? So we can do that. That's not hard. Um, but then synthetic similarity scores, like, okay, how do we do that? Well, if we have a small data set, uh, there is another type of model out there called a cross encoder. Okay, so by encoder is what we all know, sentence transformers, where you're creating those vectors. A cross encoder is... Um, it's different, it's like a, imagine like a BERT model, you feed two sentences in at the same time and it's gonna output like a similarity score. Cross encoders, obviously they're, they're pretty slow because if you do that for like a, a data set of like a million items or more, uh, you're gonna perform like a million BERT computations, okay? If you're just comparing one query to those one million. If you wanna compare all of them, it's gonna take even longer. Um, so it's incredibly slow, so that's why we don't use it for vector search. But 
what you uh, what you can do is or, or what is good with these models is that they do train quite accurately quite quickly okay so with that small data set we can we can train a cross encoder sometimes and then we use that cross encoder so here we're fine tuning it the cross encoder here we're creating those random pairs that i mentioned before um, and we can use that cross encoder to actually after we fine tuned it actually label those random pairs that we created okay so now we have a labeled data set that is synthetic with labels so we merge the gold so the gold data is like the original data set the silver data set is a synthetic data set we merge both of those and then we can fine tune it um, we can fine tune the, the bio encoder model with that um, just by synthetically generating more data okay so uh, this is pretty good because we can start with a really small like one to 5k data set performance is reasonable um, but then there are obviously still problems like there is with every technique uh, the initial data set you, you still need to label it with similarity scorch which is like annoying and, and takes a long, long time um, you must also find find the you must also fine tune the cross encoder uh, which may or may not work and overall the, the process is just more complicated there's more models involved there's all this data set data sets going all over the place um, so it can be difficult okay um, so that's data augmentation and this is still data augmentation here as well but data augmentation for asymmetric search so uh, in in search you have symmetric and asymmetric so what we saw before those data sets were they were kind of symmetric because the two pairs of text are very similar size, very similar um, like form, you know, where they're coming from. But a lot of use cases don't do that. Okay, this symmetric approach, instead they are asymmetric. So a good example of this is question answering. So question answering, you have a, a question, uh, like imagine you type something into Google. Usually, you know, if it's a question, it's a few words long, even if it's just a normal keyword query, you're just gonna type in a few words there. But what you're returning is not just a few words, it's like a, a web page. So in that case, the passage or the context that you're returning is much longer than the query, and that is asymmetric search. This is an example of that for question answering. Um, so, sorry, so, Okay, so with that, um, we can, like, like we did earlier, use MNR, so that multiple notice ranking, that still works with this. Uh, but when we have low resource, it, you can't use MNR uh, directly anyway, okay? Uh, TSE, I mentioned before, it only works for vanilla similarity. And uh, the augmented expert format with stores just is not ideal, right? So are there other approaches we can use? Um, well, or other approaches we can use for augmentate, augmenting our data. So there are sequence sequence transform models out there. So given a passage, they can generate like a, a few queries. Um, but obviously we, we're gonna need a sequence sequence model to, to do that. Uh, fortunately, there are a few of them out there. So given a particular passage, we can use a um, sequence sequence model like T5, and we can use that to generate a set of queries like we have here. So this is about Python and we have all these queries about Python. Um, so. Oh, <laughs> okay, no worries. I thought it went a bit quiet. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, so we can start by just finding some passages from the from the internet they don't need to be in pairs at all um, and then we just generate queries using that t5 query generation model or some of the query generation model okay so we just have the passages uh, and then after the query generation we have both queries and passages together um, and then we can kind of do what we did before so multiple notes ranking we can do that and you know we can 
we can you know, fine tune a model uh, that will have pretty good performance uh, as long as those queries being generated are of high quality. They're not necessarily going to be. Um, so yeah, I think I uh, just said that. So just plain text data, good performance if we get quality uh, generations, uh, but we're kind of prone to poor quality with those. So that's a problem. Um, and we need a pre-trained query generation model. That can be a problem depending on, on what you're looking at. Uh, it's, there are a lot of them out there. Okay. Um, so is there a way to avoid this bad performance? Yes. Uh, we can use something called generative pseudo labeling. So up here, we have that GenQ approach that we just talked about. And we follow that up with a negative mining step. So negative mining that I mentioned before. So we get some negatives in there. Uh, and then we use a cross encoder, like we did with the augmented SBIRT part, to actually uh, assign those scores. Okay, so we, we assign like a, a margin score. So how different are they, it's a positive and a negative. Okay, and this kind of adds a, a bit of resistance to, to any, um, any poor generations. So um, here we have the, sorry, we have the negative mining and we have the, the, or the pseudo labeling stuff. Negative mining, um, that improves performance quite a lot with this technique, so GPL, uh, you can see here. And the pseudo labeling step, like I mentioned, it just kind of gives us a bit of resistance. So with uh, GenQ, we're gonna get one item at the top, that's uh, our positive. The rest of them are seen as negatives, but that's not actually true, okay? So yes, this one at the top is the most relevant, uh, but the other ones have like varying degrees of relevance. And thanks to the pseudo labeling step, we're actually able to represent that. Okay. Um, and as well with, uh, with GPL, we can also use other techniques that we just spoke about. So I mentioned the unsupervised method before TSAE. With TSAE, uh, we, can, we can replace the sort of mass language modeling, pre-training of BERT with something like this, with TSAE. And if we do that, we actually see that the performance after fine tuning with GPL increases as well. So we can kind of use a, a mix of all these different techniques that we've just spoken about in order to get better performance from our uh, encoding models. Okay, so just to summarize uh, all of those things, uh, how to fine tune if we, if we have pairs and labels, um, if we're very lucky, uh, we can use something called cosine similarity loss or other methods um, most of the time we don't have that, maybe we just have pairs. We can use multiple negatives ranking. Um, if we don't have much of anything, but we do have a model that is trained in a source language um, and we have translation pairs, we can use multilingual knowledge distillation. If we have uh, small sets of pairs and labels, uh, we can use augmented data methods like um, augspert here. For asymmetric use cases, we use GenQ, and if GenQ doesn't perform very well, we can go ahead and try GPL. So, yeah, uh, that that's the, the end of the talk. Um, if you there's a few links here, um, the ebook, like I said, it kind of just covers everything I just went through, but in a lot more detail. So I'd recommend taking a look at that uh, if you're interested. Okay, and any questions? Thank you, James. Okay, so do we have any questions from the floor, James? Right at the back, fantastic. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I have a question regarding um, like the amount of hard negative in relation to positive and so on. So is there any like, I imagine it's like hard to say in uh, straight terms, but is there like, Kind of a rule of thumb, like one third is hard negative, one third is uh, challenge, and one third is hard positive. Yeah. So with um, with the method we spoke about there, so a lot of slides here. So if we go back to MNR, um, basically what we want to do is here we would basically instead of this being a Siamese network or Siamese model, uh, there would basically just be another step here. Okay, for your negatives. So you'd have your positives going through here, 
and then you had your negatives, hard negatives going through here. So you're going to have one hard negative for every, every positive uh, in this case. Um, with GPL and the other approaches, you can you can not do that. You can have um, more or less hard negatives. I'm not sure what the ratio would be there. It probably depends a lot on your use case. Okay, do we have another question? Jane has obviously explained it so well, you completely understand it. There will be a test later. Any further questions? Okay, so we uh, don't actually have any questions online, but uh, I'd like to just uh, thank James. All right, thank you.